Good morning and guten tag. Welcome to the inauguration of the Max Planck University of Toronto Centre for Neuroscience and Technology. I'm Tafik Baliente, a neurosurgeon at the Toronto Western Hospital, a scientist at the Crumble Brain Institute, an engineer, engineer wannabe with cross appointments to biomedical and electrical and computer engineering, and with my friend and colleague, uh, Joyce Poon, uh, the director of this new centre. We begin with a land acknowledgement to give thanks to the Indigenous people of Canada. Although this event is taking place virtually, we wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. On behalf of President Gertler of the University of Toronto and President Stratman of the Max Planck Society, I welcome all of you to today's events. I'm Joyce Poon, Director at the Max Planck Institute of Microstructure Physics in Halle, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto, and the Co-Director with Tofik Maliente of this new joint centre between the University of Toronto and the Max Planck Society. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Bilateral Science and Technology Cooperation Agreement between Canada and Germany. It was nearly exactly half a century ago today on the 16th of April, 1971, when the agreement was signed in Bonn. To mark this special occasion and to celebrate this new collaborative center, we are honored today to be joined by Ambassador Sabine Spavasa, Germany's ambassador to Canada, and Ambassador Stéphane Dion, Canada's ambassador to Germany and special envoy to the European Union and Europe. The other esteemed representatives in today's signing ceremony are Professor Ted Sargent, Vice President of Research, Innovation and Strategic Initiatives at the University of Toronto. Professor Klaus Blom, Vice President of the Chemistry, Physics and Technology Section of the Max Planck Society. And Dr. Kevin Smith, Chief Executive Officer of the University Health Network in Toronto. The agenda for today will begin very shortly with a formal portion of the inauguration, um, which will uh, be the um, speakers in the panel. Um, and then there'll be a short uh, um, introduction of the center given by Tofik and myself. And then after that, we'll take a short break for about uh, 10 minutes um, until um, 9.55 a.m. Uh, Toronto time or 4.55 p.m. Germany time. And uh, the this portion then will consist of four scientific talks, uh, which will highlight the breadth and depth of the work related to the major themes of the Max Planck University of Toronto Center. And the speakers uh, for, the after, uh, for that later portion of the event will be Viola Prisaman, Metan City from the Max Planck Society, and Sheena, Sheena Jocelyn and Sean Hill from the University of Toronto. It is now my great pleasure to ask the president of the University of Toronto, Mary Gertler, to kick off the formal part of the inauguration. President Gertler. Thank you, Joyce. Good morning, guten tag. Greetings to everyone joining us from Germany and Canada. I am so delighted to be taking part in the inauguration of the Max Planck University of Toronto Center for Neuroscience and Technology. On behalf of the University of Toronto, I'd like to extend special greetings to the president of the Max Planck Society, Professor Martin Strachmann. We're also very honored to be joined by the Honorable Stéphane Dion, Ambassador of Canada to Germany and Special Envoy to the European Union and Europe, as well as Her Excellency Sabina Sparwasser, Ambassador of Germany to Canada. And greetings also to the representatives of U of T's partner hospitals who are with us today, including my good friend and colleague, Dr. Kevin Smith, President and Chief Executive Officer of the University Health Network and those joining us from the Hospital for Sick Children and the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. The University of Toronto is immensely proud to partner with the Max Planck Society in this exciting new endeavor. After all, the Max Planck Society is Germany's most successful and celebrated research organization. It is counted among the world's most respected and prestigious research institutions. Dedicated to excellence in basic research, it is at the forefront of global scientific innovation. Likewise, the University of Toronto is consistently ranked among the world's top universities. Its faculties, including the Temerty Faculty of Medicine 
and the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering are Canadian and global leaders. U of T enjoys close partnerships with a network of world-renowned teaching and research hospitals, including the great institutions represented here today. And it is the academic anchor of Toronto's biomedical and biotechnology hub, one of the world's leading clusters of research and innovation in this field. Therefore, Max Planck and UFT are ideally suited to form a close collaboration. And this is especially true when we consider our combined talent in brain function and health. MPUTC researchers aim to develop and deploy advanced technologies for the study of brain circuits for the improvement of human health while charting new territory in computing. The new center will also focus on training the next generation of world leaders in this crucial field. Its joint PhD program will leverage the expertise and infrastructure of its partner institutions while providing international experience for these incredibly promising young researchers. In closing, I'd like to thank and congratulate the co-directors of the MPUTC, Professors Joyce Poon and Tofik Valiante. We wish you every success. We look forward to following the center's accomplishments in the years to come. And now I'm very pleased to turn over the virtual podium to Professor Martin Strappen. Yeah, Professor Gertler, I hope you all can see me. Yeah, I hope you can see me. Um, uh, dear Professor Gertler, uh, President of the University of Toronto, um, uh, dear um, uh, Canada's ambassador to Germany, Germany Mr. Dijon, um, dear Germany's ambassador to Canada, Mrs. Uh, Sparwasser, um, have a very warm welcome. Um, have a very warm welcome uh, and hello from Munich um, today. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I have to say at least virtually. Um, and uh, it's really great that so many of you followed our joint invitation. It would have been much better, obviously, to see ourselves in person, in particular in Toronto. But I think this is the best we can do these days. Today, we celebrate the inauguration of the Max Planck University of Toronto Center for Neural Science and Technology. And I have to say that the Max Planck Society Center program is our top-notch program for long-term and trust-based collaboration with outstanding international partners. It's a highly competitive program. Um, it's very, it has a very comprehensive selection process. And if you look at our established centers from some distance, then I have to say it's a who is who in science, which forms the backbone of our international network, a network we are really proud of. The preconditions of a center is, first of all, outstanding excellence among scientific excellence among all partners, but also uh, it's a precondition to provide an exchange platform for young scientists and, for example, also for infrastructures. Uh, this center that we celebrate today prevailed this selection process, and so my real congratulations goes to all of you. I would like to thank in particular um, uh, Stuart Parkin and Joyce Poon for the big motivation, the efforts to kick up this huge collaboration, uh, and in the end also for their success. My uh, thankfulness also goes to the University of Toronto, their scientists, and of course, President Gertler for your confidence and support in this center. And but last but not least, I would like to thank all the employees from the administrative department on both sides. They made in the end this um, center really um, uh, happen. Now, this new center is special, I have to say, because it's truly interdisciplinary and much broader than the other centers I'm at least aware of. We, at the moment, have two Max Planck centers in Canada, one together with the UBC and solid state physics, and one with Ottawa on photonics. This now is the third center, completely different from all the other ones, anything but monodisciplinary, but it really breaks disciplinary boundaries. Um, the great Canadian scientist and pioneer in neurosurgery, Wilder Penfield, once said, a scientist is not to be trusted when he ventures out of his special field. But he knew even at that time that you have to team up with others if you want to take advantage of technology, technological achievements being made elsewhere for your own specific field of interest. And that's what we are up for today. 
This center is a unique project, even within the overall portfolio of the program line, as I mentioned before. Uh, at the moment, more than 12 Max Planck Institutes are involved in this center, and that's for good reason. They want to team up with Toronto as a top partner in the field of neuroscience and artificial intelligence. And indeed, my colleagues in the Max Planck Society are excited to deepen their collaboration with their colleagues and friends from Toronto. The neuro community in Toronto excels in really very many different subfields. I would like to mention only a few theory, artificial intelligence, hardware development, neurosurgery. And the Vector Institute, for example, is highly regarded in Europe, even reaching attention on the federal political level. I have talked many times with Angela Merkel on the Vector Institute you have in Toronto. It's a role model for what we also try to achieve here in Germany. So Toronto is a key player, I have to say, in cutting edge artificial intelligence, but it's also you also have pioneering work in the translational part um, uh, and many, many, many other fields. So it's really, I'm really happy, I have to say, to team up with you guys. Finally, I have to say neuroscience and, neuro and innovation in this field is in a very specific situation today. And I think this center adds a new quality to neuroscience. My impression is that we now seem to have reached a threshold where so many new methods come together that a giant leap could be possible in the future. Optogenetics, modeling, imaging technologies, organoids, new chips, hardware, all this has been invented over the last years. And now the next steps will, will uh, be used to combine all these tools in a clever way and also to advance science at the interface between informatics, artificial intelligence, brain-machine interactions, and modern neurobiology. Um, so I think there's much to be done. And I'm really looking forward for the science being done in this unique center, which tries to bring all these different elements together. Let me say only very few closing remarks, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are celebrating 50 years of Canadian-German science and technology collaboration. And indeed, we have really strong ties between Germany and Canada. Only for the Max Planck Society, we have at the moment 150 Canadian visiting scientists with us. We have 120 collaborative projects with our Canadian partners, uh, 25 of them with the University of Toronto. And all in all, we have now published 1,300 papers together with the University of Toronto over the years, top-notch papers in very different fields. So today is the opening of a whole new chapter in this relationship. It's a great chance, and I have to say, it's a real great joy also. So have great success. Thank you very much. And now I have the honor to hand over to Sabine Sparwasser, the German ambassador to Canada. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Schwartmann. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I can only e echo exactly what you have said. I want to begin with congratulating all of you. Professor Joyce Poon, Professor Tofik Valiante, most of all, for starting the new Max Planck uh, U of T Center for Neuroscience and Technology. We have just heard very impressively what an exciting endeavor this is. My heartfelt congratulations also go to President Merrick Gertler and to President Martin Strachmann for joining together uh, what we've heard already also, um, uh, what are two of the world's best science institutions and to, to research this unparalleled computing system that is the human brain. Now, I've been in Canada for many years or on and off in Canada for many years, and I followed the University of Toronto's pursuit of excellence in everything, but especially in medicine and in new technologies with huge admiration. Uh, the U of T has created many um, really important hubs. Professor Stratman has just mentioned the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. The Mars has been a leading institution and the list could go on. On the other hand, our Max Planck Institution, Gesellschaft, is for us um, a, real, a real institution of pride for Germany. Uh, it's as old as the Federal Republic of Germany, 
it is our most researchful, uh, most successful research uh, organization has produced no less than 20 Nobel Prize winners. So what we see today is a match made in heaven. And between Germany and Canada, we have established a habit of making such matches. And it was 50 years ago, that has been mentioned as well, that we planted the seed with an agreement on signed cooperation between our country, countries. This has produced such a rich harvest, the most dynamic and the most fruitful field of a really great bilateral relationship is in science and technology and research. Our country's academic and research culture is very compatible. We are very proud that by now we have between our two countries, 600 university corporations. We have so many joint um, research projects. Just a few examples. The German Research Foundation funds more projects in Canada uh, of their top research projects than in any other country in the world. That's very impressive. Or as um, a President Stratman said, the Max Planck Institute has such strong relations. Three out of 23 institutes worldwide are now in Canada. That says something about the climate of research and about the fruitfulness of the research that we have together. I could go on, but I will not. I just wanted to say for the 50th anniversary of our research relationship, I could not have hoped for a more inspiring project. So thank you for doing this. My eminent colleague, Stefan Dion in Berlin, who's also the special envoy of the prime minister to the EU, he can say everything much better um, and I'll hand over to him. But for me, a last wish, every success for your work many new ways of improving health through your research and I wanted to thank you. Over to you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shen Savina. Thank you so much. I, you spoke very well and I agree with everything I have heard up to now. So let me try to explain in my own words why we must be very proud and happy with what we are announcing today. So President uh, Stratman and Gertler, Vice President Sargent and Blaum, the Chief Executive Officer Smith, Professors uh, Poon and Valiente, Ambassador Starwasser, ladies and gentlemen, Mayanne uh, Damen and Herren, Mesdames et Messieurs, we are inaugurating today the significant strengthening of the capacity to spread uh, scientific innovation. Today, we consolidate the links between two major research institutions, true monuments of knowledge and excellence. The Max Planck Society, and uh, Sabina, my number is 35, 35 Nobel Prizes from the Max Planck Society one of the foremost basic leading research organizations in the world and the University of Toronto. And all Canadians are very proud of the University of Toronto, UFT, among the best in the world and credible performer, both in number uh, and quality of publications. So uh, Dr. Poon and Valiente, the government of Canada that I represent today, uh, I represent today the government of Canada, has enormous expectations of you and that of your teams, no pressure. Uh, the Max Planck University of Toronto Centre for Neuroscience and Technology is certainly your dream come true. After years of hard work, I don't underestimate the work it represented, you are going to invest in this new research centre, all your talent and science, and all the ethical values in which we all believe. So much it is true that technological innovation is built upon the ethical foundations of the scientists, institutions, and countries involved, and the value they stand for. You will be inspired by, inspired by, and you will prolong in your own way the 50 years that we spoke about, I've been not just spoke about it, 50 years of scientific cooperation between Germany and Canada. It is indeed on April 16, 1971, that Jean-Luc Pépin, a great minister, Canadian Minister of Trade and Industry, and Walter Schiel, the German Minister of Foreign Affairs of the time, 
sign the agreement on scientific and technical cooperation. So almost a day for their year, uh, uh, 50 years ago. This is no doubt, there is no doubt that the Max Planck Center for Neural Science and Technology at the University of Toronto will open a new chapter in this great tradition of research, which combines the immense capacities of two of the most innovative countries in the world, Germany and Canada. So let's all come back together in let's say 50 years from now, all together in 50 years from now, to celebrate the centenary of German Canadian Scientific Corporation and the 50 years of an institute which at that time will have, I am sure, done a lot to improve the health and the well-being of humankind. Uh, maybe not to the point to guarantee that we will be all back ale and hardy in 50 years from now, but well, let's dream. In this, spirit, in this spirit, I wish you, Professor Poon, Professor Valiente, and your fellow researchers, a successful start and lots of success. Now, I look forward to the remarks of Vice President Ted Sargent. Vice President Sargent, the floor is virtually yours. And I understand you will talk about uh, the importance of uh, collaborative research from the perspective of U the University of Toronto. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Merci du fond du coeur. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let me add to the good mornings in Canada and the good afternoon in Germany. And uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you and to thank you for being with us today. Well, as Vice President, Research, Innovation and Strategic Initiatives at U of T, a big part of my mandate is to establish, support and grow research initiatives that cross institutional and thematic boundaries. And so I'm very happy to report that our partnership with the Max Planck Society satisfies all of these conditions. Today, we're celebrating an extraordinary venture to share knowledge, explore opportunities, mentor new talent, and generate new ideas. And it's between two of the world's great research institutions. It's a partnership that's gonna drive not only cutting edge research, but also innovative education and research translation in neuroscience and technology. The collaboration we're talking about today has bold ambitions. The joint expertise and the infrastructure of the partnership's two host institutions will enable over 25 PhD students to have firsthand access to the expertise and the infrastructure at U of T, the University Health Network, the Hospital for Sick Children, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, as well as of course, the Max Planck Network of Research Centers. This, collect, this collaboration will function as a benchmark for international and multidisciplinary neuroscience education and research. Neuroscience and its associated technological innovations requires collaborations of scholars who speak different languages, use different tools, and develop different skills. The MPUTC will catalyze these potentially transformative networks by bringing together our two nation's premier research institutions in this emerging area. Looking back, it was several years ago that Joyce Poon, a U of T professor of electrical and computer engineering, joined the Max Planck Society and is now a director at the Max Planck Institute for Microstructure Physics in Germany. We're enormously proud that Joyce is co-director of the MPUTC for Max Planck. And we're also very pleased that Taufik Valiante, an associate professor in the Department of Surger Surgery in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine at U of T, and a scientist at the Kremble Research Institute in the University Health Network, is co-director on the U of T side. Together, Joyce and Taufik will be guiding the day-to-day -day operations and strategic direction of the MPUTC, bringing together world-leading researchers in engineering, physics, neuroscience, neuroinformatics, and neuromedicine to catalyze new discoveries at the intersections of these fields. Thanks to all of you here today for your engagement and your support and for your contributions of expertise and creativity toward the knowledge and technologies that will lead to a better future for all of us. And now I have the great pleasure of handing the podium over, the virtual podium over to Klaus Blom, the VP Chemistry, Physics and Technology for MPG. Klaus. Yeah, thanks Ted. 
Professor Poon, Professor Valiante, President of University of Toronto, Professor Gertler, Vice President of University of Toronto, Professor Sargent, Ambassador, Mrs. Sparwasser, Ambassador Dion. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor to celebrate the inauguration of the Max Planck University of Toronto Center for Neural Science and Technology with you today. For me, in fact, it's the very first center inauguration as vice president, and I'm very pleased that I can precisely attend the opening of this center where world-class researchers of two strong institutions intend to unite the promising and forward-looking fields of neuroscience and artificial intelligence to achieve improvements in human health, a topic which is currently at the center of our perception worldwide. On the one hand, there are the Max Planck Institutes with their strengths in fundamental research and devices, neuroscience and neurobiology. On the other hand, there is the University of Toronto with the leadership in technology, clinical research and training programs. Two players who complement each other perfectly in two fields with high scientific potential. Both act as a model for developing and testing ideas about how the brain performs computation. At the heart of this development, which combines insights from neuroscience with those from nanoscience, supercomputing, electronics, and artificial intelligence is the analysis and constructive synthesis of brain functioning. Let me briefly outline the research expertise of two scientists as examples who have contributed greatly to the creation of this center, namely Joyce Poon and Taufik Valiante. Joyce Poon is an expert in three-dimensional multi-technology microsystems with focus on devices and systems that bring nanotechnology into brains. Taufik Valiante is interested in understanding the building blocks of human brain and the ultimate manifestation of their collective activity. This research expertise of both scientists shows that this cooperation offers the unique opportunity to test the neurotechnologies and conduct in vivo neural recording of the human brain. From my own experience in leading a center with Riken in Japan, I can confirm that the planned brain circulation, be it in the framework of visits, workshops, or as a result of the joint Max Planck Center, Max Planck Society, University of Toronto PhD program, will generate synergies, will lead to high level publications and will contribute to the center's overall visibility and attractiveness. Coming to the end, and I, I would like to wish you good luck, a lot of energy for all the scientific adventures and breakthroughs lying ahead of you. Thank you. And with this, I would like to hand over to Kevin Smith, CEO of the University Health Network of Toronto. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you. Guten uh, Tag, bonjour, good morning, uh, honored guests, distinguished group. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the University Health Network. Our network includes the Toronto Western Hospital, the Toronto General Hospital, the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, and the Michener Institute of Education. We are so proud to be affiliated with the University of Toronto and have long mutually reaped the benefits of our strong and productive scientific partnership. In my view, strong partnerships are indeed the key to success, perhaps never more so than during these challenging times. Partnerships are truly the reason why we're getting through this pandemic, that and the power and elegance of science, which this collaboration will only extend. So it's a real privilege to be celebrating both elements with you today. The Max Planck uh, Society is one of the world's great research organizations, and we are truly thrilled to be chosen to partner with the University of Toronto to create a world-class center for neuroscience and technology. This is an incredible moment for science and research, and while most importantly, for patients. At the end of the day, that's why we're here. While Max Planck has opened several highly esteemed centers around the world, this one is truly unique in its vision. We know that basic science has brought about the world's most important returns. Today, I think we can't think of a better example than looking to the vaccines that we are all relying upon to help us end the scourge of, of this pandemic. 
But while this new center will focus on developing novel neurotechnologies for preclinical work, it will also truly bridge the gap between that work and translate it directly to patients who will benefit. This is why Max Planck has partnered with hospital-based research institutes for the very first time through our partners at the University of Toronto. UHN is very proud to be one of these leading institutes as Canada's largest research hospital. We stand in esteemed company with our colleagues at SickKids and the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health. This is also the first time a physician scientist has been appointed a director. UHN's Dr. Tofik Valiente, we are truly fortunate to have as a scientist at the Kremble Brain Institute at UHN. Dr. Valiente has a long and, impressed, and long impressed me with his research prowess and of course, his skill as a neurosurgeon. But what I truly admire most about Dr. Valiente is his ability to unite people around complex problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanna thank him for agreeing to take on this important work in partnering with Dr. Joyce Poon, co-director of the center and through the Max Planck Institute and the U of T Center for Neural Science and Technology. We know we can look forward to a continuing 50 year tradition of advancing neural research between Germany and Canada. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, I apologize initially for uh, some technical difficulties. Uh, uh, thanks everybody for your support, uh, raising the bar very high for Joyce and I, uh, of course, uh, and recognizing the excitement that we have uh, around this uh, center. Uh, Joyce and I now would like to take you through uh, a little more about what the center is about. Uh, although President uh, Strutman and many of our esteemed uh, speakers have uh, kind of spilled the beans. So um, but we'll take you through some details. So really the primary research aim of the Max Planck University Toronto Center for neuroscience and technology is to advance the fields of neuroscience and neuromedicine by creating and deploying new tools and techniques to study the brain. It's only the third Max Planck Center in Canada and continue a long tradition of scientific collaboration between Canada and Germany. Very important to us is the center's strong focus on talent development and creating cross-disciplinary interactions. Thus a major focus of the center is a joint PhD program between the participating Max Planck Institute and the University of Toronto. Cooperation between Max Planck and University of Toronto scientists will be done through the co-supervision of PhD students and their thesis research. In the joint PhD program, a PhD student will be co-supervised by a U of T professor and the science and a scientist in the Max Planck Society. The PhD student will start at the University of Toronto for their first year, followed by up to three years being based in a Max Planck Institute. This unique PhD experience will provide to the student a unique and global exposure and the opportunity to experience the best of both worlds while earning a doctoral degree from the University of Toronto. By design, the Max Planck University of Toronto Centre is egalitarian and thus open to participation from researchers at any Max Planck Institute and any University of Toronto department. It already involves institutes in both the chemistry, physics, technology and, bio and biology medicine sections in the Max Planck Society and professors from the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering, Faculty of Medicine and Faculty of Arts and Science at the University of Toronto. To our University of Toronto Max Planck colleagues, if you're interested in joining this effort, please do not hesitate to contact Joyce or myself. So um, the Max Planck Society and the University of Toronto have enjoyed a very long history of interactions that uh, we've heard Professor Strutman uh, describe. Um, and I'd like to share one very specific and special story most close to my heart. Um, the external scientific member of my institute is Professor Sajeev John, who is a professor of physics at the University of Toronto, specializing in optics and condensed matter physics. And he and Toronto physics professors were very close collaborators of a late director at my institute. And there had been a lot of exchange between my institute and Hala and Toronto about 20 years ago. Um, and last night, I even discovered a joint patent be between them. So we can see that this interaction between the Max Planck Society and the university truly runs long and deep. However, it has never been conceived before a collaborative effort as large and as broad as the Max Planck University of Toronto Center. When I was appointed a director, I actually started to discover many similarities and also a great deal of complementarity between the Max Planck Society and the University of Toronto. Both organizations are publicly funded, forward looking, but they have different missions. The Max Planck Society, as we've all heard, is renowned for its fundamental research. 
The institutes have amazing research facilities that are specifically tailored to the experiments and needs of individual directors. The research is long-term and blue sky. And it has been mind opening for me to visit some of these institutes and to witness the transformational buildup within my own institute. The immense resources dedicated to scientific inquiry at the Max Planck Society are truly unparalleled. Meanwhile, the University of Toronto is a very large public university with more than 14,000 faculty members and 93,000 students across its three campuses. The uh, university is very urban, where ideas and energy seamlessly flow between the city and the university. The education and research missions of the university are deeply intertwined with its communities. Despite its massive size, University of Toronto consistently ranks as one of the top universities in the world, and it's a leader in many disciplines. So being from the University of Toronto and an engineer has taught me that I'm part of something much bigger than myself, and also the importance of service, that those of us who are privileged should strive to help our organizations and communities become better. After all, the motto of Toronto's engineering science program is engineers for the world. So when I became a director, I thought, well, wouldn't it be amazing if Toronto researchers beyond just my group and myself can have a chance to experience the Max Planck Society? And wouldn't it be amazing if more in the Max Planck Society could experience Toronto and work with the very talented and motivated students and faculty? I wanted to bring together the goodness and the uniqueness of the Max Planck Society and the University of Toronto together in a way that is as broadly beneficial as possible and not just be limited to my own research specialty. So around this time, Joyce and I had been collaborating quite a bit and in fact uh, built what we affectionately call the, call the Max Planck Collaboratory at the Crumble Brain Institute, where we have shared equipment and do continue to do collaborative neurotechnology and neurobiology experiments. The primordium of this new, newly established Max Planck University of Toronto Center represents an example of the much needed cross disciplinary interactions to advance brain science. Indeed, you know, as a, neuros as a neuroscientist and a biology bio with a biology engineering computational bent, and as a practicing neurosurgeon, the societal need for developing new physical tools towards use, towards uh, use and deployment in, in the human brain is always at the fore of my uh, always at the fore of my thoughts. Although my particular subspecialty is epilepsy, the broad requirement for new ways of recording from, decoding, and modulating brain circuits is no better highlighted by the fact that neurological condition costs more to society than heart disease and cancer combined, costs that will only continue to increase with our aging population. With the brain represent, representing arguably the most complex structure in the universe, an approach spanning in space from genes to the whole brain and in time from milliseconds to a lifetime of embodied learning is required. Such an approach is only made possible when conceptual silos are broken down. The Max Planck University of Toronto Center represents such an entity that unified multiple disciplines with the vision of translating the neural science and technology that emerges from these collaborative endeavors towards the human condition. The three major themes of the center are first, development of new physical tools for the observation and stimulation of the brain. This theme dovetails on the one hand with the NIH Brain Initiative's vision to develop enabling technologies for the finer and finer readout of brain activity. And on the other hand, a long tradition in clinical medicine of neuromodulation, largely using electrical stimulation, for the treatment of conditions like epilepsy and Parkinson's disease. The activity within this theme amalgamates these pursuits. The second theme is to conduct neurobiological experiments to deploy these new advanced tools. In addition to utilization of new technologies and preclinical work, the involvement of hospital-based research institutes will motivate the translation to humans. And lastly, the third theme is to analyze data, create models, and make predictions. The ability to predictably alter brain activity towards a desired therapeutic goal will require models of the brain be they computational and or mathematical. Such models of the brain are the inspiration of modern day medicine and machine learning. The Max Planck University of Toronto Center will foster, foster the cross fertilization between brain models and brains to create new machine intelligence mediated by new physical tools. Although the Max Planck University of Toronto Center will enjoy, additionally, the Max Planck University of Toronto Center will enjoy synergies with the strong neuroscience community at the University of Toronto and other neurotechnology and educational endeavors emerging within a Toronto neurotechnology ecosystem. Thus, for both Joyce and myself, it really seems like the right time for going big within the neurosciences here at the University of Toronto. And the Max Planck University of Toronto Center brings a whole other level of opportunity 
in the basic sciences and engineering to realize this aspiration. So although Tofik and I are the ones speaking today, we are only the faces of the many people who have worked tirelessly the past few years to make this center possible. Um, and we'd like to take a minute to thank them. Uh, Professor Zhang Ping Feng, whom you will see more after the break, is the Associate Director of the Center, and she contributed tremendously by helping Tofik and me. We also welcome Professor Luka Milosevic to help run the Center in Toronto. We are especially uh, delighted and thankful to have Chris Yip, uh, the current Dean of Applied Science and Engineering and the former Associate Vice President of International Partnerships at the University of Toronto uh, on our team. Without his energy and leadership, the center could not have taken off. So thank you so much, Chris. We would also like to thank the former Dean of Applied Science and Engineering, Professor Christina Amon, for her encouragement and financial commitment to the center. From the Max Planck Society, we would like to acknowledge Professor Freddy Schuth, the former vice president, who even took the time to visit the University of Toronto to meet with Dean Yip and Professor Gertler a few years ago. We thank the leadership of the Crumble Brain Institute, the Sick Kids Research Institute, the Center of Addiction and Mental Health, as well as the chairs of all the engineering departments, the Institute of Medical Sciences, Faculty of Medicine, and the Collaborative Program in Neuroscience for their contributions to seek grants and other types of support for the Toronto faculty. We are also very grateful to all of our colleagues on both sides of the Atlantic who enthusiastically joined our initiative when the center was first conceived. We are very, very grateful for their patience throughout this process to come to today. And last but not the least, the center and today could not have happened without the work of Michaela Hegersberg, Renato Bishop Dravitz, Professor Alex Mihalides, Ilan Kramer, Tanya Diaz, Diaz, and Laura Dykstra. Our hope for the Max Planck University of Toronto Center is that in five years, we will have provided an international and rewarding experience to more than 25 doctoral students who have been jointly supervised by scientists belonging to a wide range of MPIs and University of Toronto departments. We also hope to have spurred cooperation between the Max Planck Society and University of Toronto beyond neurosciences and technology. Thank you to our esteemed guests to all of you and to all of you for attending our broadcast and your attention. If you have any questions about the center, please don't hesitate to contact Joyce or myself. We look forward to the work and the opportunity ahead. Thank you. So we'll have a round of virtual applause. Um, <laughs> and now we will spend a few minutes to take screen captures to commemorate today. So first I would like to invite uh, President Gertler and President Stratman to turn on their cameras and would everyone else please turn off their cameras. Um, would the ambassadors please turn on their cameras and join the presidents? Thank you. So would Tofik uh, please join me also on camera? Uh, would all the scientific talk speakers and the panelists please uh, join the photo? I'm sorry, Tofik, you were muted. <laughs> uh, Professor uh, Sergeant uh, Kevin Smith, or Dr. Smith, I, I don't know if anyone else is missing here. That's everybody. Thank you. My Mine is uh, frozen, unfortunately. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't turn on my video. 
maybe the driver can. Yeah, let's see if we can. There you go. So thank you everybody um, for joining us. We will now take a short break. We'll return in five minutes at 9.55 a.m. Eastern time and 4.55 uh, p.m. Uh, Europe, uh, 3.55, my about 3.55 p.m. Europe time to celebrate the day with four scientific talks. See you again very soon. Thank you. Good morning again, uh, everyone. Welcome back to the inauguration event of Max Planck University of Toronto Center in Neuroscience and Technology. My name is Zhong Ping Feng, the associate, uh, the associate director of Max Planck University of Toronto Center, University of Toronto site, and a professor in physiology and Institute of Medical Science, the Director of Collaborative Program in Neuroscience at the University of Toronto. My colleague here is Professor Luca Milaswick, is a scientific coordinator for the Max Planck University of Toronto Center, uh, Toronto site, a scientist at the Cranbell Bree Institute and associate professor in the biomedical engineering at the University of Toronto. Professor Milosevic and I will coordinate the scientific talk session today. The audience here are welcome to send questions to the speakers in the Q&A box throughout the presentations. The speaker will be asked to ask one or two questions at the end of each talk, pending on time. We try to aim to run the session follow the schedule. Now, I would like to ask Professor Vilasovic to introduce our first speaker, um, Luca. Thank you very much, Professor Fung. Um, we are very excited about our talented lineup of speakers for today, and it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the scientific session. Uh, Dr. Viola Priesemann heads a research group at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization and teaches at the Georg August uh, University of Göttingen. Um, she is a fellow of the Schiemann Kolleg and member of the Cluster of Excellence for Multiscale Bioimaging at the Göttingen campus. Uh, she studies spreading processes, um, self-organization and information processing in living and artificial networks, and has most recently been studying the spread of uh, SARS-CoV-2 
uh, quantifying the effectiveness of interventions and developing containment strategies. And today she will speak about self-organization and learning uh, in neural systems. Thank you very much for the invitation. I will now share my screen. Oops. Um, and I'll talk today about self-organization and learning in neural systems. In Germany, at least, some of you might know me for my work on COVID as well. With the work I present today, I hope you can understand a bit why the two overlap. So I'm extremely excited about the close uh, link that we have now between the University of Toronto and the Max Planck Society. I think this is, as the ambassador said, a match made in heaven, because these two uh, research societies and uh, universities have so much in common. It is about large scale recording techniques that are being developed and applied in neuroscience at the moment and really at the forefront here in Toronto and uh, in the Max Planck Society. Taufik uh, Valiant, a colleague of ours, whom I've been following a lot, for example, uses it really to record activity in the brain of the human, which is uh, super amazing. Gilles Laurent, who's also part of this endeavor, uses it uh, to study turtle and lizard. The second part, new novel computing hardware is something that we really need because the classic computing hardware brings us to really strong limits. There are these beautiful programmable photonic circuits that Joyce is uh, developing and I myself will show you today something on neuromorphic chips. And finally, both in Toronto and at the Max Planck Society, we are all exploring the next generation of artificial neural networks. Toronto is more than well known for that, for let's say what's already classic by now, but we now have to work and we are now working on the next generation. I'm looking really forward to that and I'm very, very happy to be part of this joint endeavor. To give you a very brief overview about the talk, I decided to give three snippets of my work without going too much into depth, but you know, to introduce the breadth and potential collaborations that we could foster in future. And I would like to start with the topic of large scale recordings on the one hand, but the problem that we still don't see everything of the brain yet. This is a classic video from the zebrafish larvae. Um, here it is fluorescent proteins that make the activity visible. And each of the sparkling dots means that neurons are active there. And uh, what you're seeing here is from the top, a zebrafish in time lapsed activity. This zebrafish is fairly small. So we can basically record all its 100,000 neurons at least at slow speed. But the human brain has about 80 billion neurons. That's much more. And you can imagine that there is really a challenge. Also, from a physics perspective or statistical systems perspective, these dynamics are complicated. The dynamics between neurons, they are pulse like They are directed. These interactions are time delayed and that makes it necessary for us as physicists to develop novel ways to analyze this type of system and to understand them. And last but not least, the interactions are plastic. That means they are changing over time. That is the core of learning on the one hand, but makes them a inherently non-stationary system for a scientist, which again is another challenge. And then every one of you who look for us but it's really a challenge for the researcher again. There's a high dimensional topology. If two neurons are close to each other, it doesn't mean that they are connected. They might be very, very far apart. Um, <clears throat> so only if there's a direct cable between two neurons, the axon and the dendrite, and if they form a synapse, then there is a connection. So if you now here sketch such a densely connected network here, the dots are indicating the so dendrites and axons are here indicated by all these branches. You can imagine how difficult it could be and how, how much it is impossible in a living neural network to know whether, let's say, one neuron here is connected to another neuron. And what we then do, we bridge this gap between, on the one hand, recording quite many neurons by now, hundreds, thousands, maybe even 10,000 neurons with good precision, and on the hand, other hand, not having all of it yet. Um, we found mathematically that if you only look at the small part of the system, but make inference about the full system, then you might be very much biased and this might lead to misestimates. So we are developing bias-free a 
approaches. And I want to give you an example that is fairly straightforward to understand and also has a relevance for the spread of SARS-CoV-2 that affects all our lives. Let's assume we have here a single neuron. We are not really knowing to which, it is connect to which other neurons it's connected. Nonetheless, we would really like to know what is the effect of a single spike. How well does activity propagate in that network? How do neurons interact with others? These are uh, questions that I've been studying in the past decade. And now with the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2, you can imagine that these tools, these mathematical tools became extremely handy because the um, spreading of a virus in a social network where we also have a certain uh, fraction of infected people not observed, where we do not know who's really connected to and interacting with whom mathematically, this is a very similar problem. So let me walk you now in the following slides to the very basic math of such spreading. I will go through that very carefully and then show you what are the challenges on understanding the spreading, these basic questions and how we can overcome them. So mathematically, this could be spreading of activity in the brain. There's always the spike that brings your postsynaptic neuron across threshold. And uh, we know that these chains of activity, they either die out when one neuron on average activates less than one neuron in the next time step. And you know this parameter by now, it's called R in uh, disease spreading, the re reproduction number. If one person on average infects less than one person, then these chains will on average die out. If one uh, neuron activates more than one neuron, then we'll have this exponential growth initially. And these two states are separated by what is called a critical state that has very interesting properties because it's on this transition of activity dying out or exploding. You can imagine that the brain might want to be close to it. For the mathematicians or physicists among you, the formal definition of such a branching process is a recurrent uh, stochastic process. Now we would like to know what is the spreading in such a network. We would like to know it from just observing the activity. Do we really now have to follow it step by step? That is not the case. If we look at the observed activity at one time point and the observed activity at the next point, time point, we can put them into a relation and the regression between the two, that is what returns the estimate for the spreading parameter. This is how very roughly at least first order also the reproduction number is roughly calculated. This is all straightforward, but imagine now you don't see all of the events. You miss quite a large fraction of them. Then you get into a problem. I want to illustrate it here. Imagine this is spreading dynamics either here dying out or becoming exponentially large. And then there is, let's say, only three electrodes in the sketch measuring the spreading dynamics. What do we observe? Hardly any. Seems like we're experiencing some uh, technical difficulties here. We'll see if we can get this resolved shortly. We appreciate your patience. Thank you. Our speaker will be returned shortly. Thanks for your patience again.
I feel so bad, as you can imagine. This never ever has happened to me. Um, should I continue with the talk, I guess, or at least with the last few slides? Uh, yes, please. It looks like you have about five minutes or so with the talk anyway, so you can you can carry on. Okay. So the main point from this aspect is that it is, as I showed you in this slide, difficult. Yeah, it is. It is difficult to infer the spreading if one only sees a very tiny subset of the of the network. But we found a mathematical way to overcome it. Skipping these details, to summarize the properties, we can have this control parameter m uh, r, which tells us how much the activity spreads. And we can quantify it precisely from just a fraction of all observed neurons. This estimator is efficient, it's precise, it's very easily applicable. It only requires knowing this observed activity or the observed number of infected at every single time step. It does not require knowing the system size, the number of units you sample, or any of the moments of process of the process. Under ideal conditions, and I say ideal in the sense that all the neurons would be the same, which is not the case, we could estimate it from just a single unit. This is pretty crazy. It says we want to know about spreading dynamics in the entire network. We only measure one single unit, and from the return times at that one unit, we can estimate what is the spreading of activity in that network. In reality, we typically need to average about some 10 or 20 neurons. This approach is adopted and for anyone who wants to um, use it, we have a Python toolbox out. Now, I already told you that the spreading dynamics is what really, uh, let's say, helped us to investigate the spread of COVID now. Here is an example in a real world how this new estimator we have improved the estimates over older ones. So if the conventional estimator, which is let's say really fairly simplistic. If one has all the units here in green from a system sample, then one gets back the true uh, parameter R. But if one only has 100, 10, or, or one, one unit from the full system, then the system breaks down. Kalman filtering does a bit better, but for a few units also breaks down. Our estimator has the correct estimate even for a single unit. And we demonstrated back then already that this already works for uh, spreading of measles in the society. Our estimator returning the correct estimate, even if we only observe 1% of the population. And this means that the unobserved fraction also in COVID is not a problem to estimate the R parameter. Here's a number of uh, papers from our group that came out following this uh, approach but a lot of other people already um, have their estimates as well. So spreading dynamics and information transfer. I'll give now two slides on this aspect because now we can infer the spreading dynamics. What do we do with it? The classical hypothesis in the field is that the system should be exactly at this R of one because then one is between activity dying out or activity being explosive and the information transfer would be maximized at that point. However, another group in the field really writing books about it, it's research fields. They argue that the brain should rather be here in a state where the activity is very much disordered, where most of the perturbations are quenched as quickly as possible. No one argues that one should be here in a state of R larger than one where one would have exponential growth initially. What we found with our novel estimator, we could resolve that strong contradiction in the field and quantify precisely where the cortex is operating. And we find a value of 0 0.98, which is almost at one, but it's not quite there. And we find it in rat, in cat, in monkey, and in humans, so in many different animals. It seems to be fairly universal that the spreading of activity is best described by being close to the R of one, but not yet there. So why specifically 0 0.98? Well, in this regime, very small changes here enable you to basically switch more from this disordered to the more critical state by just tiny changes in your spreading behavior. 
you could imagine a neural modulator doing that. A neural modulator would induce such a small change. And that would really drastically then be able to change your information processing properties from more the disordered to more the critical state like. So we think it's not one, but it's a state, but that the animal can switch between the two. In fact, if one would be very far away, the same change would hardly make a difference. If one would be close to the transition, one would risk instability and potentially epilepsy. We find evidence that cortex really makes use of this. This is the cortex of a macaque monkey, and we estimated this parameter and found that it differs from visual area to frontal ones. Because of the glitch, I will uh, skip the last part on neuromorphic computing and um, would like to uh, show you how this uh, overview slide about what we are doing in the group. It's the spreading dynamics that I already showed you. It's the subsampling theory with which we can assess the net, uh, the collective dynamics. It's local learning rules that optimize computation where we really need the new compute hardware and we use information theory to design and quantify computation. Last but not least, and that's something I find very interesting that this basic research paved the way to finally um, do meaningful research on COVID and help us to mitigate the pandemic in Germany and in the world. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. And I really want to thank my group for working on this exciting topic together with me. Thank you very much, Professor Vilalda uh, Prisma, for the for the fantastic talk. So sorry about the technical issue uh, over your talk. And um, so our tech team actually has handled it quite well. Thanks to the tech team. So um, uh, here is a question. Uh, let me see there. Um, So um, there's a, a question for you is that um, you use the lava for use the zebra fish. Have you been able to um, uh, do research on the um, uh, adult uh, zebra fish? Or is currently the technology only allows to the lava uh, for the developmental change because there is a developmental issue when you do lava of the fish compared to the adult stage. Uh, the synaptic activity, synaptic modulation can be different at the different uh, uh, developmental stage and uh, growing stage as well as aging stage. Um, so um, indeed the zebra fish larvae has the big advantage that it's still fairly small and it's transparent and this is one of the main advantages and the hundred thousand neurons still put you at a certain limit this is now being adopted more and more to also the uh, older fish because one of the things that we want to study is learning is plasticity and this doesn't happen too much in this as yeah. larvae, it turns yeah. out. <laughs> I'm following that closely, but I myself, I have not uh, any active project in that direction, although I would be very interested. Thank you. Um, so another question is that, um, so um, how the, uh, so the idea is that uh, when you do the uh, recordings right now, the is that a neuron identified neuron? identified means they have a specific target in co 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 coordinate or in connection with the pre presynaptic neuron. So they have a specific function which lead into a neural activity that contributed for the specific synapse or syn specific group of neuron or specific individual neuron over the synaptic connections. Mm -hmm. So the identity of the neurons plays a large role, the, especially the smaller the animals are. Um, there they often have a, even a specific name then or a type. In, it really always depends on the research question whether you need it or not. In our case, when you think about the spreading dynamics, we don't need the identity of the neuron. It would even be okay if you 
almost switch your neurons from time to time <laughs> and mix it all together. It still has to be from one recording. I can't combine recordings from several sessions into one analysis. I would have to do that in separate analyses. So it must be somehow from the same system so that I have information about the relative timing of these spikes. That's all I need, but I don't need spike sorting. And therefore it's a fairly powerful method oh. in the sense of you don't need very highly specialized type of recordings. Obviously the better the recordings, the better the analysis we can do. And the type of recordings I showed you from the macaque monkey of the cortex, where every uh -uh. single brain area has a different working point. And every working point means that the cortex is, it's really specialized to some other uh, type of computing in terms of transferring or rather storing information, for example. So this part is, um, this is uh, different from cortex to cortex. And there um, it's good to have good quality re recordings. Otherwise, one needs fairly long recordings to partial that out for all these different brain areas. Thanks. Um, we may have a last question uh, related to the computing uh, system, what your uh, computer algorithm you're using. So the branches of neuron may be, may be variable from cell to cell, from neuron to neuron. So how um, applicable of your algorithms in term mm -hmm. of interpretation of the real life neuron connections. So we do not infer whether there is a connection between one and the next neuron. And that's really one of the big challenges we have in neuroscience. We can see the neurons by now, which is great, but there is at the moment no way to resolve which two neurons might be connected by just looking at these branches by the, at the ex axons and dendrites. They are so thin and they are so abundant that one in this, let's say, spaghetti can't follow. It's like trying to follow a single spaghetti in your pot of spaghetti. Mm -hmm. It's uh, close to impossible. And um, what we therefore estimate, we assume that the connection is sufficiently typical and random. And then we say the typical propagation of activity is with the R of 0 0.98. And the R of 0 0.98 means we are not at one. We are slightly below. And this makes a large difference in terms of the dynamics, because it means that over time activity would die out. That gives you room again to have new input that will be processed from the outside. So it's a balance of amplifying from what comes from outside so that then the internal computation can be done, but then there has also to be room for new input to be processed. So you want to have an R slightly lower than one for good computation. And where precisely, whether you're then at 0 0.95, 0 0.98, 0 0.99, that depends on your brain area, that depends on your specific task. Mm -hmm. And that would have been also the talk on the third part of the neuromorphic chip. There we could tune the chip to different working points and we could show and demonstrate that uh, depending on the task, it works best in one working point or with another task, it needs a different working point. So what we saw and observed in cortex we then find it back in the neuromorphic chip where we can tune it and see that depending on task, one or the other working point is really the best one. Thank you very much uh, for the illumin illuminating talk, uh, Professor Viona uh, Priestman. And Thank uh, thanks much. again. And uh, we will move on to our next speaker. So which is Professor Xiang Hill the director of the Crandall Center for Neuroinformatics, a senior scientist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and a professor at the University of Toronto. Professor, professor Hill is a computational neuroscientist with extensive experience in building large-scale computational models of brain circuitry. He applies large-scale data integration, neuroinformatics, multi-skill brain modeling and machine learning to improve our understanding and treatment of mental uh, health disorders. Today, Professor Xiang, is, Professor Xiang Hill is going to deliver his talk entitled, A Multi-Skill Approach to Brain Disorders. Please join me to welcome Professor Xiang. Hey, thank you very much. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. Can. So, to, so today, um, first of all, I, I wanted to say that it's very exciting to have this center launching. Very, we're very happy that uh, CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, 
which is Canada's largest research mental health hospital, uh, is, is participating in, in, the, in the center. And, um, and I wanted to talk a bit about some of the work uh, that is actually done in collaboration with a number of the, the members of, of the new center, uh, but also how we at CAMH look to integrate that into patient care. So first of all, the Kremble Center for Neuroinformatics is uh, embedded within the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Uh, it's a mental health hospital, and we collaborate very closely with clinicians and health professionals, um, really in an iterative fashion, combining research, uh, tooling, electric, new measures, new technology for measuring uh, from patients, and then organizing that data, building computational models, and then iteratively building tools that are useful both for clinicians as well as for patients to, uh, to, to better treat, better diagnose, um, and, and improve outcomes for mental health patients. And one of the challenges that we face is that uh, mental health disorders are currently really defined based on symptoms and, and symptomology with the underlying biology. And so one of our grand challenges and the grand challenge in the field is how do we build a multi-scale understanding that, that helps us relate, for example, the genetics to the proteins, to the cells, to the circuits, to the whole brain, as well as then to the behavior and the, and the entirety of the, the individual patient's uh, history and, and, and condition. And in order to do that, we're, we really have to establish a systematic collection of, of data, um, really across different scales from genomics to molecular to clinical, neuroimaging, mobile, wearables, all the way to the population level, but really transdiagnostically across all of those different diagnoses so that we can start to, to have an integrated perspective of mental health disorders and brain disorders and, and start to link those to the underlying biological conditions. So we've launched the CAMH Brain Health Data Bank, which is our flagship effort to collect high quality longitudinal data, to collaborate closely with clinicians, to deliver evidence-based care and, and, and collect data uh, directly from the, the clinic and from patients. Uh, also integrating research measures with care, so deploying mobile and wearable devices, as well as collecting samples, biosamples for genomics and proteomic analysis. And then collecting all of that data, organizing it into a neuroinformatics platform that really supports uh, large scale integration of data across disorders and across. Uh, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, Professor Hill, yes. but um, I'm not sure if you have been advancing your slides, but it doesn't look like they are advancing. Oh, no. Let's see. I have been. Um, let me just try to reshare. Um, Let's see, try this again. And let's see, can you see it now? It says share. Uh, just try to advance one. Yeah. They're not advancing, it's, it's on the same slide. Well, that's new. It says sharing is paused, actually. It's quite odd. Because it did, it did, let's see, let's try this. Resume sharing. Okay. This did work in the in the tests earlier, but let's see. Are you maybe able to just uh like not do the presenter view and just scroll. yeah let me just share the whole screen actually um, yeah. as well so um, alternatively we can share your screen on your behalf and advance the slides you just have to prompt us when to do so okay let's um let's just see If I let me just see, can you see that now? 
we can we can see the um but it's not changing still okay yeah all right uh, and we can't see your like presentation we can just see the, the like the slide deck not in presentation yeah so this is quite strange all right all right so yeah if you're able to to share um, on my behalf I don't know if you have the latest, if, if the latest one was downloaded. Let's see, okay, let's go ahead. Great, they have the latest, fantastic. Let's, let's go ahead um, and, and pass this one. Uh, one more forward. Okay, so in the context of the Brain Health Data Bank, um, one of the things that we've developed is an individual personalized chart for patients in collaboration with the clinicians. And this, this is really an opportunity both for the clinicians to see the data that's being captured, but also have value in, in individualized predictions and classifications for those patients. So our goal is to build computational models that can inform um, individual patient classifications, diagnoses, stage. Um, and this is a starting for us. Of course, iteratively, we're building models to improve the feedback on individual patients. So if we go forward to the next slide, what, one of the observations is that um, a, there are a lot of commonalities across virtually all neurologic, psychiatric, and substance abuse disorders. Um, first of all, across virtually all of these disorders, there are observed changes in brain excitability. And so if we go to the next slide, there are also change, observed changes in brain connectivity. To the next slide. And in sleep. And to the next slide. And in brain energy metabolism. And so to the next slide as well as immune responses. So with the next slide, part of, part of what we're aiming to do is understand the linkage. What is the relationship between all of those factors? And we hypothesize that brain circuit excitability is the final common pathway that actually uh, alters brain connectivity, uh, impacts cognition and behavior, changes sleep brain, and impacts brain energy metabolism and immune response. And of course, this, there can be other causal interactions, but what our challenge is, is to, is to dis dissect those causal interactions and understand the specific configuration of different brain disorders based on those components. So with the next slide, one tool that we have to do that is integrative multiscale modeling, computational modeling of brain circuitry. And that process really starts with organizing the data, building models, running simulations, computer simulations on a supercomputer uh, to validate the model and, and test hypotheses, and then to continue refining and iteratively improving this model. Next slide. So we're building off of work on um, where I was and, and also Professor Itai Hai, who's part of the Kremble Center here, um, also started, which is in the Blue Brain Project, where we worked to integrate multi-scale data about the neocortical microcircuitry of the rat. Uh, this is laboratory data collected over 15 years, characterizing individual electrophysiological patterns, three-dimensional shapes of neurons, electrical behaviors, um, gene expression products, synaptic communication, the cellular composition of the circuit, a lot of data from about 20 to 30,000 experiments um, characterizing this one circuit. And we had the challenge of figuring out how could we build data-driven models from this data. So the next slide. These are some of those building blocks. These are the representative of the diversity of different types of neurons. On the left are inhi inhibitory interneurons. On the right are excitatory uh, pyramidal cells and stellate cells. And this collection, this 55 morphological types of neurons all work together to build a microcircuit in, in the brain, a cortical microcircuit. Next slide. And so Itai Hai um, developed, he pioneered really the data-driven approach to building 
this model of a layer five pyramidal cell. Um, this is all based on rat in vitro data and, and really capturing the ways in which synaptic integration works within the dendrites and the, and the cells fire in response to stimuli and building using machine learning techniques to build these biophysical cellular models. The next slide. And then we use the statistics of the, of the uh, composition of these cells, the diversity of cell types and their densities to build up a virtual reconstruction uh, of the microcircuit in three dimensions. Um, and this lays down that foundation for potential uh, synaptic connectivity. So it's really, uh, if we look inside, you, you can see this tangle, this spaghetti that Viela was, was talking about where there's dendrites coming close to axons and that's forming the potential connectivity between these neurons. And then when we put all 31,000 model neurons into place, that creates kind of the structural form for a circuit. And then of course we have to layer in many additional constraints to capture the functional synaptic uh, properties and, and locations. And we did a lot of work to, to really establish the principles that would help predict that connectivity. Next slide. And when we put all of that together um, with the short-term synaptic dynamics and so on, the circuit gives rise to uh, this emergent property, these low frequency oscillations um, when, when, we, when we stimulate it. Now, if we just give it a, a general excitability um, through, for example, changing the extracellular potassium concentration, this rhythm starts to emerge. And this is quite striking because it's quite similar to um, sleep rhythms, for example, or in, in intrinsic rhythms generated by the cortex. If we go to the next slide. And we took the same microcircuit model and could replicate it multiple times and slice it to create a virtual brain slice um, in order to recreate and validate against additional experiments. To the next slice. Side, slide. Um, so additional tools that we developed were to really bridge the scales between the cellular and synaptic level of the circuitry to the local field potential or the signals that would be measured, for example, by an electrical um, electrode placed in the tissue. And so here we're actually computing from each individual neuron the extracellular potential as well as then the summation of, of the contributions to that extracellular potential from all of the, the neurons within the circuit. And so this gives us a way of really relating the kind of the brain waves that one would see from an electrode or from an EEG um, to the underlying cells and circuits. And this is of course a key capability uh, important for this collaboration. To the next slide. And just related to, um, Viola's point earlier, one of about the transition between kind of critical, uh, subcritical, and, and and supercritical states. Um, one of the things that we saw was that modulating cortical excitability would actually cause the circuit to to transition between these states. So on one extreme, we have a hyperexcitable or sleep-like state where there's these traveling waves. Um, at, at the other end, where we have a normal excitability, this is actually right on the cusp, this is a kind of a critical state, the, the circuit is precisely responsive to the, the stimuli. And so it actually can differentiate quite precisely between different um, stimulation patterns. Whereas in the hyper excitable state, it basically, once there's enough input, it triggers a, a traveling wave and, and any kind of specificity is lost. Next slide. So this work was um, really built by you know, 82, there's 82 co-authors on, on the work from the Blue Brain Project. But in the next slide, we're taking, we're building off of that work um, to, to tackle, uh, you know, one of the core questions of um, some of the cellular and synaptic basis of specific mental health disorders, in this case, major depressive disorder. And in this context, uh, Professor Etienne Sibyl at CAMH um, has been studying for quite some time the fact that somatostatin positive interneurons, 
which is one of the types that I showed you earlier, is actually uh, impacted by um, depression and by aging. And uh, it's, a, it's a key source of inhibition uh, onto pyramidal cells. And this, this is a kind of a schematic of a microcircuit of cortex. And so we want to understand what is the role then of these somatostatin positive neurons um, in regulating the state and the excitability of the circuit. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, and this is this change in somatostatin positive GABA neuron markers is observed across many different disorders from Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, major depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar. And so there does seem to be a common mechanism. It doesn't mean that every case of this has it, but there's at least subtypes of disorders that implicate somatostatin positive uh, interneurons. Next slide. So this work, which uh, has recently been put on a bioarchive, um, was really done in collaboration with Tofik, Valiante, Etienne Sibyl, and Itai Hai, if we can go back one slide. And it really, um, for the first time, creates a model, a, a computational biophysical model of human microcircuitry. I'll kindly ask you to, to wrap up in about one minute. Thank you. All right, we'll do that. And, um, and the reduced inhibition, uh, they're able to explore the fact that the effect of somatostatin positive interneurons changes the inhibition in the circuitry and impairs stimulus processing in human microcircuitry. So if we go to the next slide, these are some of the cell types that they modeled actually from data captured in, in Professor Valiante's lab. And to the next slide, actually built a microcircuit out of this and were able to run simulations uh, to evaluate the impact of that alteration and excitability. So to the next slide. Uh, I think we'll skip ahead to the next slide. Um, so what we're doing now is, is be, because we see this link between, well, the, key, the key slide was the previous one, where we see a link between excitability and sleep, um, we're measuring act using actigraphy and heart rate in the lab, in, in the clinic, the sleep structure of individual patients, as well as then EEG, and go to the next slide. Um, to the next slide. So our uh, objective now is to bring in these additional measures that look at um, EEG, look at sleep, uh, and look at blood markers that indicate inflammation and integrate that into the chart. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to go through all, all of the reasoning for that, but let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to the whole team. Um, apologize for the technical issues. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Hill. Sorry to have had to, to rush you a bit. Unfortunately, with the technical issues, we're running a bit behind. Yeah, I understand. Um, hopefully, the third speaker will be crystal clear. Um, we'll have time for one uh, quick question here. So, question is, how important would it be to have uh, building blocks from human tissue in the development of these multi-scale models, um, or is it good enough to have uh, rodent or non-human primate um, in the development of these virtual reconstructions? So I think it's a, it's a great question. Of course, um, in order for us to know that, we need to understand, we have to have some samples from human in order to see how different is the human cells and synapses from the rodent. And um, there, there, you know, while there are similarities, while there are principles that are conserved between uh, rodent and human, there are clearly important differences. And, and the tremendous opportunity with the work of uh, Professor Valiante is to have access to that actual human tissue and, and cells to characterize that. So I think it's still an open question, but um, we're, we do see cases where it's quite important. Wonderful. Thanks very much for your talk. Um, you. So we will move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Metin Siti. Uh, he is the director of uh, the Physical Intelligence Department at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, Dr. Siti is also an honorary professor at the University of Stuttgart, uh, professor at ETH Zurich, uh, and professor at the Koch University in Istanbul. Uh, he is an IEEE fellow and recipient of the Breakthrough of the Year Award uh, in the fall, uh, Falling Walls World Science Summit 2020. Uh, his research interests include physical intelligence, small-scale mobile robotics, uh, bio-inspiration and wireless medical devices. Uh, and today he will talk to us about uh, wireless miniature medical robots for neurological applications. Please take it away.
Hi, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate for the new center and this collaborative effort. Um, and look forward to seeing a lot of um, fruitful collaborations in the new future. So um, I'm a director at Max Planck Institute for Intelligence Systems. My institute also deals with AI and many other areas could be relevant. But today I'll talk about our research activities in my group, which is more related to new robot systems for neurological applications at the small scale. Um, so first question is why do we want to have wireless tiny robots for enabling new neurological uh, applications? Um, so if you look at brain itself and also our vascular system in the brain, um, accessing these regions uh, currently is enabled by catheters, uh, surgeries, um, and sometimes if it is close to the surface, optical and other uh, and ultrasonic waves also is possible. But if you want to really directly access a, a deep region inside the brain uh, in a minimally invasive way rather than a surgery, uh, and it's, if it is very risky, having a tiny robot that you can control precisely is very advantageous. So for example, for stroke and aneurysms, um, and also accessing to brain through vascular system uh, is can be enabled by very small robots that they should be, of course, at the cell scale at the, in the vascular system case. And also the same devices could be implantable because they are wireless and, and they don't have to be connected to the outside world directly. That makes a minimal invasive operation for even long durations in the sense of neuromodulation, for example, inside the brain or cancer therapy that if the re cancer repeats, we can use the same robot to go and treat again. Uh, this could be done inside the brain tissue or in the ventricles. Of course, when you get many advantages of uh, having very tiny wireless devices, it, uh, they, it also comes up with many scientific challenges um, in the sense of limitations. If you are so small, of course, you have very limited power. Your propulsion is very limited. So how to move inside tissue or in the different regions with the flows. Uh, communicating with outside world, uh, how much onboard computation you can have, memory you can have, and also what kind of functions you can have with a given limited size. Um, and also when you're so tiny, it's hard to track it and also control again with all the dynamic things happening in the brain and also other regions. And safety is always a challenge when you have an active device. How do you make sure that the device doesn't cause any chronic issues, any material issues, any immune response, any other damage to brain that can create other invasive side effects? So if you look at overall challenge of building these tiny wireless devices uh, to operate in brain and other regions of the body, you need to deal with, at the same time, a lot of uh, scientific problems of how to design and make these devices out of materials that are biocompatible, also even sometimes biodegradable, uh, how to deploy them. Will they come from the intravascular system? Will they be inserted by a catheter or even a microsurgery uh, can put these devices in the, in the body? And what kind of functions will they have? Will they have neuromodulation? Will they do hyperthermia? Will they do cauterization? Uh, they can do biopsy. We, we can do many uh, things that were dreamed before, but in the last 10 years of my group and many other people in my field has really created tools coming more and more, uh, enabling new functions that were not possible to do before. Of course, many barriers exist when you are in the body. Um, as we know, in blood brain barrier is one example in the brain case, and many other barriers you need to pass through uh, depends on where you're deployed. And, and also you need to be able to track by some medical imaging modalities. So your robot needs to be able to be seen by MRI or PETs or um, uh, X-ray or whatever modality you need to use for the given operation. And eventually you need to really precisely control it for a safe and also uh, functional operation. So let me give you examples of the projects that we have progressed in recent years that could be relevant. Uh, one is coming through the vascular system. As I said, you need to be really small, like red blood cell size, otherwise you will block microcapillaries in brain. So how can we make microbots that can go inside brain and other areas in vascular system? Um, one solution is making microparticles uh, that have functional surfaces. In this case, HALF is a surface where we can put targeting antibodies for selective detection of tumor and other uh, any functional uh, surface you want to stick to or attach to. And also drug molecules you can also put on the surface and also inside the volume. And also other HALF has, in this case, magnetic films that helps for actuation from outside. So you can see these things. You can make them from a few microns up to, of course, bigger. But of course, for microcapillary systems, you need to be down to three micron, five micron to be safe. 
And the idea here is in the vascular system, the big challenge is, um, I mean, there are a lot of attacks from immune system and more importantly, the blood flow is so fast. And if you're a tiny robot with your propulsive forces, uh, and also if you miss the, uh, the right capillary or right vessel, how can you go back and go to the right track? So that's really important. Otherwise, it will take you hours and hours to reach the right target. So in that sense, we need to uh, go against blood flow. And one thing we looked at as inspiration is if you look at leukocytes, what they do is they move on the surface of the vessels and then they go inside the tissue because the blood flow is the lowest um, around the boundary of the vessel. Uh, that's what we use as an advantage. And then we created this magnetic roller um, that is driven from outside using electromagnetic coil systems. Um, and here, because of the antibody functionalization, you can see that uh, normal healthy cells, the particles will not stick on the vessel wall, but if there is a cancer cell, they can detect because of the antibody and then can get stuck. And then later you can do hyperthermia or deliver chemotherapeutic drugs, or you can even go inside the vessels if, um, if you have some other strategies of breaking the wall and maybe releasing nanoparticles or drugs. So uh, as I mentioned, one of the major goals and breakthrough here was uh, if you have a blood flow and if you are again in the junction of a capillary or a vessel, uh, and if you uh, are not in the right track, can you go back? And the answer is yes, with the surface rolling design. And of course the robot is rolling with hundred Hertz and in one second, hundred times, it's really fast. Uh, and that's why uh, we can create a lot of propulsion against the flow of the blood and then go back. And this is real blood in the channel created here. So these things are becoming possible. And, and recently, this is on published work in collaboration with ETH, we can now also image these particles in vivo. Uh, this is a mouse brain in the circular villus. Uh, you will see these uh, five micron particles, um, amazingly small, but photoacoustic imaging is a great tool now, can penetrate the tissue in mouse with almost whole brain. Uh, you see these particles, we can visualize with their fast proportion with the blood flow. So that's the good news. And now we are trying to integrate with the active control system and now this imaging in the near future to enable to go to target location in the brain for different medical functions. So uh, one issue is when you come to the right target, getting inside the brain or uh, tissues is a big challenge. And one thing we are looking at right now is taking the real immune cell of a patient. Uh, for example, in this case, a macrophage, we engineer them and, and attach them with synthetic magnetic and other materials where we can actively drive now macrophages synthetically. I mean, this is not a natural motion for a macrophage, but you can drive it like a micro robot because of the attached magnetic element. And the element also has special um, chemical that stimulate the macrophage in the right way that it can be used in immunotherapy. And then the nice thing about macrophages is they can penetrate the tissue and we will now go deeper in the tissue and, and do different functions that we couldn't do with the synthetic big particles. So um, coming to the uh, more neurological application demonstration, as you know, deep brain stimulation is uh, now the golden standard for Parkinson's disease or treatment where you can get a probe inserted in the brain with microsurgery and that probe can stimulate uh, the subthalamus region when there is a uh, Parkinson's disease, um, any, any behavior or any vibration so that you can basically stimulate here to stop such uh, disease uh, related uh, issues. So the problem is this is an invasive process and it needs to stay with the patient all the time. And that's why a lot of people are looking at right now, wireless technologies of how to access deep brain and, and stimulate when necessary. So uh, there are ultrasonic approaches and other approaches, but we recently have been looking at magnetoelectric nanoparticles um, where we showed some promising results in collaboration with neurosurgeons in Netherlands. And hopefully uh, I can also collaborate uh, people in Toronto in, in neurosurgery so uh, we can, basically what we did here is the first demonstration, we implanted the particles, which are magnetoelectric, into the deep brain region mac using macrosurgery, like typical way of the microneedle, but then we closed everything and inserted and left the particles there. Then with remote magnetic fields, uh, what you could do is, if you have a, a magnetostrictive core of the particle and outside is piezoelectric using uh, biocompatible piezoelectric materials, uh, you can apply alternating magnetic field and some DC field is also necessary to induce charge on the surface of the particle, which will stimulate the neurons. So we did first in vitro imaging uh, and, and test results here, you see in vitro uh, neuro, uh, neurological cells that we can stimulate them by applying both alternating and, and DC field at the same time from outside of the brain. Of course, in this case, in vitro. And the next we did in vivo, 
in collaboration with Netherlands. And here you see the particles uh, in the subthalamus region. And one another uh, factor you can use besides costume imaging as we did in Metro is CFOS expression will show if there is a neuromodulation or not, or neural stimulation or not. When we don't only apply the cinematic field, there is almost no uh, stimulation. And when you apply with the alternating field, which is a very small field, by the way, uh, you can see that expression happens with CEOs. That is a proof of uh, neural stimulation happening in that region. Um, towards the Parkinson-related treatment, we also put into the um, live uh, movable mouse because we can make external magnetic fields that mouse can still move around freely. And, and we showed that behaviorally when we apply AC and DC field, the mouse speed behavior change, that's a proof of stimulation happening. Of course, this is the very first stage of showing wireless stimulation minimally invasively. Uh, and in the next steps, we would, we'd like to also get these particles without, rather than a microsurgery through the uh, vascular system to the uh, right region in the brain. And also we need to look at more long-term toxicity effects. We didn't see toxicity in the short term and they, we need to optimize functionality. And we also like to move these particles actively because in neurostimulation, one big issue is when you put a stationary probe or particle, of course, it has a nice stimulation for a given duration, but things move around. And also if you want to stimulate different region by time, the nice thing about magnetic robots is you can move them around and then stimulate different regions uh, on demand. So that's, I think will be very important for understanding neurological behavior and plus in treatment uh, in a more minimal, minimal invasive way. So uh, the next is I want to talk, talk about more bigger robots, mini scale, but they are still very important functionally because we don't need to come every time from the vascular system, we can come from different regions. So this is a new work that's not published that I want to share. Um, we basically build these magnetic different shaped robots these days with no problem at even micron scale, but also in mini scale. Uh, and the idea here is accessing to the tissue regions and, and where we can go through the uh, uh, cerebral uh, fluid um, and then uh, from the ventricles to the brain, which is uh, very advantageous um, to access areas that is not possible to access from a uh, skull. So uh, the idea is with magnetic guiding uh, here, for example, this is a demonstration under uh, fluoroscopy uh, medical imaging. So you see this mini device is controlled here, the patient, I mean, the um, brain is moving and the magnetic system is stationary that you can see we can have complex trajectories inside the brain. Assuming we know the path to take to reach the right target, this robot can do biopsy or stimulation or even um, uh, drug release type of different uh, medical functions. Uh, another modality we are using is MRI uh, because we know in brain imaging, MRI is amazing with functional MRI and many other modalities. But also the great thing about MRI, by turning it into a robot, basically we program the MRI systems rather than only imaging. We also make them active uh, manipulation systems with magnetic gradient coils inside. We can pull medical devices in the body wirelessly and then also wirelessly communicate with these devices inside MRI and then do different medical functions. Uh, a recent example that will be published soon is, so you see that we can also track under MRI while we are actuating because MRI gradients apply uh, pulling forces, if you have a magnet particle on the robot, here you see very small particle on the robot, which is the reason that we can pull the device around on their um, gradient fields. Um, however, with the high V0 field, the robot alignment is a problem. That's why we developed a new method here that we use a wax that we remotely heat and melt, and then the robot can rotate when we want to change its uh, orientation. So you see this device at the tip is where we apply hyperthermia to the tissue or deliver drugs uh, by remote um, heating-based functional control. Um, another last example is we can also make fully soft or not non-rigid devices uh, for medical applications in brain and other regions. Here, as a uh, breakthrough, a few years ago, we could show magnetically programmable soft elastomers that can create many complex shape uh, changes by all remote control of uh, magnetic fields that we use from outside. And this is an example, a not published result to show you that this is a, a mini soft device that we can move in the ventricular regions. Uh, it is, of course, a mock-up. It's not still uh, tried in the animals yet, which we will do in the near future. So you can see that now we can drive these soft devices in a safe way because they cannot damage anything because they are soft. And we can navigate them in complex region in the body with remote control. 
even one another interesting thing besides moving and navigating and applying uh, some medical functions. Uh, also, we know that, as you know, in brain, the cerebral fluid is pumped through the cilia in the brain. And, and some patients have uh, cilia problems. And also, we recently created uh, synthetic cilia that wirelessly we can actuate from outside of the brain. And that means if, again, you have a cilia problem in your brain that causes issues of the flow, and that's, of course, very dangerous, we can make now synthetic cilia that can move uh, the uh, cerebral fluid with no problem from outside. So these are some examples, and this is a, a great team of people in all different disciplines, including medicine. Um, and indeed, one of my students is now in Toronto, or now means he's now a associate professor in mechanical engineering department there. And we are very uh, we are collaborating with a lot of people, and hopefully through this center, we will also collaborate with uh, uh, people interested in this type of enabling technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Martin uh, City, uh, for this inspirational talk. Really great. Um, we open to the question. The first question came from the floor, uh, Professor Kemal uh, Yuludak. So the question is that um, instead of using magnetic field for stimulation of uh, nanorobots, can ultrasound be used? Can ultrasound be used? Uh, that's a great question. Yes, the answer is yes. Indeed, that's the second modality we use a lot in my group that I didn't have time to show uh, because in brain, ultrasonic waves also can reach to deep areas, even for neurostimulation, which is very interesting now tool people are using without understanding how it works, though. I mean, there are a lot of complications because of complex mechanics and also materials and, uh, of course, neural system in brain. But definitely ultrasound is a great tool also to in, in, enable remote uh, forcing of devices, which we do with a bubble. If you add on a bubble uh, to the robot, you can drive it around actively with ultrasonic waves. And also you can stimulate it through uh, shearing of the vibrations at resonance that can open blood brain barrier, also a, a well established tool these days. So definitely ultrasound is a great tool we are using. Photoacoustic system I showed for imaging is also we are using now at the same time for acoustic actuation. Thank you. So the next question is from uh, Julia uh, Bandura, a PhD student. Do these devices uh, have potential for performing surgery-like manipulations? Um, yes, um, basically the, one of the major surgical uh, tool is cauterization. Um, that in that case, you need to go much, relatively much higher temperatures. And with the milli device case, micron device is still challenging with the size scale issues. But with the milli device I showed, which can go inside the tissue, you can remotely induce high temperatures and then uh, you can definitely create microsurgeries um, in a very precise way inside tissues. That's possible, uh, but it's relatively demanding with the temperature requirement that needs a relatively high power transfer requirement for heating the tissue. Definitely becoming possible. And drug release is easy, hyperthermia is easy because they are low temperature, but the surgery is, I can say, one of the hardest, but also other challenges safety-wise. When we go surgery, we keep it for the latest uh, applications because uh, surgery means you can really damage things significantly. So how can you guarantee the safety of the patient and the automation of the system to make sure that we don't do undesired surgeries. So that's why um, we are considering it, but it's not in our top priority at the, at the moment. So it seems we have a, a little time for one question from a Professor Yi Tei Hei. Could a similar technology be used to sense, to sense sorry, I, uh, I missed the question. Uh, Sorry. The question was uh, to, to record neuronal activity in addition to, yeah, recording capabilities. Uh, that's another great question as a next step topic. Um, definitely recording is possible, but then you need to also have a communication method. Um, it will be definitely not a typical way that people do with the uh, microprobes where everything's tethered and you can get nice signals. Um, so our ideas are more using biological interactions with more chemical ways of creating signals by when there's neural signal happening, detecting it biologically rather than electrically. 
So there are, again, depends on the method you can use to detect a system, um, neural, neural activity and then use medical imaging to say, oh, there is an activity going on uh, because we are very deep. There is no way to get optical access to that deep region. That's why we are looking at much new techniques than just typical electrical techniques right now. But it will be possible in the near future. All right, thank you very much again for the fantastic talk, uh, Professor Seti. So we were, thank you. We were move on to our last and not least, but our final speakers today uh, to Professor Sheena Jocelyn. So Sheila, Professor Jocelyn is a senior scientist at the Hospital for Sick Children and a professor in psychology and physiology at the University of Toronto. Professor Jocelyn holds a, Canadian, holds a Canada Research Chair in Brain Mechanisms Underlying Memory, is a senior fellow in Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, and a fellow of Royal Society of Canada. Professor Jocelyn is interested in understanding how the brain encodes stores and use information. Today, she will discuss how her lab take advantage of some novel new tools to answer long standing questions in memory research. She's going to talk about making memory in mice. Please join me to welcome Professor Jocelyn. Thanks so much, Zhang Peng. Um, and thanks everybody for tuning in and sticking with us to the very end. It's wonderful to be batting cleanup. And I just want to say first off that I'm so excited to be a member of this center. I think it's going to be a really fun venture. And um, as Zhang Peng said, what I'm really going to be talking about today is um, our lab's efforts to make memories in mice. So we think that uh, this is a picture of Toronto. This is Toronto, you know, a couple weeks ago, it's sort of sad and lonely. And this is a much nicer memory of Toronto when uh, the, the same place was packed with, you know, 2 million of my closest friends when we actually won the um, 2019 NBA championships. And I can't wait for us to get back to that spot. So my lab is really interested in understanding how the brain encodes, stores, and uses information. We think that's a really basic process. We think it's not only important for understanding how the brain, this you know, uh, arguably the most complex organ known to uh, in the universe, um, functions, and it's also really important in trying to help people with memory disorders. Everything from something like autism spectrum disorder to Alzheimer's disease can be thought of as um, a problem in basic information processing. So my lab is really interested in how the human brain makes memories and stores memories, but a lot of the tools that we use are not available right now in the human brain. So we're gonna focus on the mouse brain. So it's been known for some time, the idea that um, memories are stored as enduring changes in the brain probably dates back to Plato and Aristotle in um, ancient, Greece, ancient Greek times. But I'm gonna start off today by introducing a German um, scientist, uh, Richard Semen. And um, my German colleagues will help me to um, pronounce the names of his two really, really key books that he published. I'm gonna do it in English. So in, um, 20, 1921, um, the, the meme was published, and in 1923, mnemonic psychology was, was published. And why am I talking today about this sort of older historic figure? Well, he came up with two incredibly useful terms that I'm going to be using today, two important terms in memory. So he came up with the term engram, which is basically akin to what we call now the memory trace. And he defined it as the enduring, the primary latent modification in the irritable substance, the brain, produced by a stimulus. And I love that definition. So understanding how um, memories are stored in a brain is super important. And here he gave us this lovely fuzzy definition that doesn't really tie us down to anything. He also came up with a really other good term that I'm gonna be talking about today, ECFRI, which is basically the process of memory retrieval. So he defined it as awakening the engram out of its latent state into one of manifested activity. So this is Richard Semin, and he um, uh, unfortunately died in 1918. And a lot of his work was really overlooked. Now, this is a picture of Daniel Schachter, and he is currently the William R. Kenny Jr. Professor of Psychology at Harvard University. He's a very well-respected memory researcher. 
And this is a picture of Dan Schachter that he kindly shared with me from way back in 1978, where he was a psychology graduate student at the University of Toronto. And this is a picture of Dan when he was in Zurich. So why am I showing you this picture? Well, one day Dan was sitting around with one of his colleagues. And when you're a graduate student, your colleagues are fellow graduate students. And he was saying, you know, I really find the term engram and actually super important in my research. And yet I know very, very little about the scientists who introduced these terms. So he went and traced back the history of Richard Semin and found his letters and found a lot of correspondence back in Zurich. And this is a picture of when he went there. And in fact, he took a sabbatical while he was a graduate student and ended up writing a book called Forgotten Ideas, Neglected Pioneers, Richard Semin and the Story of Memory, which is a really fabulous book about in-groups and out-groups in, in science, who gets cited, who doesn't get cited, who gets credited. And it's a really important book about science in general and certainly about memory research. So this is a picture of, this is um, Paul Franklin, this is me, and this is um, Stefan Karlar, way back in the 1990s when we were um, psychology graduate students at the University of Toronto. And we were so inspired by Dan Schachter writing a book um, while a graduate student that we decided that we would, A, not write a book. In fact, back in grad school, I'm not sure if any of us actually read a book, but we have um, all gone on in science. And every now and then we get together and try and um, take a deep dive into the history of science, into the history of memory, the history of engrams, and, and talk about how these old theories are now becoming possible to test with the advent of new tools. So back in 2017, we wrote a paper for Journal of Neuroscience, which we called Heroes of the Engram, where we identified really important people we felt in the history of memory research and engrams. So we identified Richard Semin, who I've already told you about, Carl Ashley, Donald Hebb, Wilder Penfield, Brenda Milner, James McConnell, and Richard Thompson. And we challenged readers to say, hey, in your field, who are the real heroes and why do you think these people are important? So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about our second hero, which is Carl Lashley, because if you've ever taken Psychology 101, you're probably familiar with the name. And if you haven't, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. So 1920 to 1950, those are not his birth and death dates. Those are the birth and death dates of one key experimental idea where he tried to search in the brain for where an engram is stored. Where is a memory stored in the brain? So what did he do? Well, he used rats and he would train them on a task such as traversing this maze to find you know, a wonderful morsel of cheese or something wonderful at the end. Then he would lesion out little bits of the brain trying to find exactly where this memory is stored. Where is the engram? And after 30 years of research, he published a paper where he concluded, and this is the wonderful summary, that the series of experiments has yielded a good bit of information about what and where the memory is not. It has discovered nothing directly of the real nature of the engram. I sometimes feel in reviewing the evidence on the localization of the memory trace that the necessary conclusion is that learning is just not possible. It's difficult to conceive of a mechanism which can satisfy the conditions set for it. Nonetheless, in spite of such evidence against it, learning does sometimes occur. And I love that because it sort of ends on a hopeful note. Learning does sometimes occur. So he published this paper um, called In Search of the Engram, and he sort of gave up and the, the sort of people looking for an engram stopped. All that research was stopped until a bunch of us um, came back and we said, hey, maybe we can sort of continue this search for the engram by using a different bunch of tools. So um, I published this paper way back and I said, hey, let's, let's change it up. Instead of teaching uh, rats or mice a very complicated task, let's teach them a very simple task and see if we can find the engram supporting this memory. So in our lab, we use auditory fear conditioning. We have mice. We give it a single pairing with a very mildly aversive foot shock. Not enough to cause any damage to the mouse, of course, just enough for, to really sort of frighten the mouse. So the mouse sort of says, what the, you know, and then at any time later after this one single pairing, this one single training trial, we can put the mouse in a different place and then we play the tone and we say, do you remember the last time you heard this tone, you received this sort of frightening foot shock. And the animal tells us they remember by um, displaying this species specific freezing response. When a small rodent like a mouse is afraid, it freezes. So in a series of studies, we said, okay, what, how can we find the engram for this um, auditory fear memory? And we figured 
based on a lot of different research, that there's probably a sparse memory code. It's not every cell within a different place is involved. It's not one single cell like a grandmother cell. It's probably a sparse code. So some cells are involved, not every cell is involved. And we said, okay, how can we, um, how does a sparse engram work? And can we artificially try and get this one cell to become part of an engram while its neighbor cell is not? So we're gonna look in the lateral nucleus of the amygdala. Here it is in a see-through brain of a mouse, and here it is in a coronal ear-to-ear um, -ear section. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna try and artificially allocate um, neurons to an engram by increasing their excitability. So we're going to use a viral vector, not coronavirus, thankfully, but different viral vectors that have no, um, no, uh, no harmful effects to the mouse. We're going to randomly infect a small subset of neurons. And the cargo that each of these viral vectors is going to have is going to serve to increase the excitability of neurons. And it doesn't matter what the cargo is. It doesn't matter these specifics. The common thing is that they all increase excitability. So we're going to have a small bunch of neurons that are random, we're going to have increased excitability, we're going to train the mouse, we're going to test the mouse, and right after the test we're going to look for neurons that are active, figuring that these neurons are somehow important in the memory and we're going to call them engram neurons. And what we found from this um, bunch of different studies is that we could bias the inclusion of these neurons we've infected with increased excitability just by um, targeting them and having increased excitability. So we are able to bias the inclusion into um, an engram. So then we did the exact opposite of the experiment where we tried to bias the exclusion of these neurons by decreasing excitability of a small population of random cells. And what we found is that we could bias the exclusion of these neurons just by decreasing their excitability in an artificial way. So from these two, um, um, data points, we, we came up with the hypothesis that eligible neurons seem to compete against one another for allocation to an engram, and the one that wins the competition that gets to store this memory becomes an engram is the one that has um, increased excitability at the time of training. It wins the competition. But to really figure this out, what we wanted to do is say, okay, if all these neurons are eligible, this neuron wins the competition, this neuron is really important in the memory trace, what we want to do is target just this neuron and see what happens to the memory. So in a series of experiments, that's exactly what we did. So we have these neurons we think are really important. Then we're going to use some genetic tricks to artificially ablate just these neurons. And we find that the memory seems to be erased. The mouse can remember many, many other things. It's just this one particular memory they can't remember. And because um, ablation killing neurons is really permanent, we've also used a bunch of different optogenetic tools where we harness the power of light to turn neurons off during the memory test. So this is our way of artificially erasing a memory by disrupting engram neurons. We said, can we do the flip? Can we artificially induce a memory by turning these neurons on? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use um, optogenetics to bias neurons into the engram. And then normally, as I was saying, during our memory test, what we do is we play the tone that um, causes the mouse to recall the memory. And what we think is the tone, the, the, the tone activates these engram neurons. So what we wanna do is take out the tone, see if we can artificially activate these neurons. And we think, this might be what uh, Richard Semon was getting at with his definition of ecphory, to awaken the engram out of its latent state into one of manifested activity. And we did it artificially. And sure enough, the behavior looked like the mouse recalled this specific memory. So next, we're going to see if we can use these new tools that people have been developing, including our own lab, to watch memories being made in the brain of a mouse. So what we're gonna do, um, this is Chen Yan, he was a graduate student in my lab, and he wanted to make a mini endoscope, which basically has a small lens that we can put right into the brain of a behaving mouse, it doesn't hurt the mouse, and using different um, tools to see which neurons are active, we can actually watch which neurons fire when um, a mouse is making a memory and recalling a memory. So this is Chen Yan, and he made these mini endoscopes, and we call them a chendoscope. So this is the actual first iteration of the chendoscope that Chen made. It's open source. Um, email us or, or download anything from the GitHub. Um, this is a, a Canadian $2 coin for those of you who don't know Canadian money very well. So, so far, we've seen we're able to artificially determine which neurons are going to hold a memory by making them engram cells. We have artificially erased a memory 
we can artificially induce memory retrieval, and we can also watch um, as neurons, uh, we can watch what happens to neurons when an endogenous memory is being formed and retrieved. So the last thing we really wanted to do here in the sort of, you know, what can we do artificially to, to manipulate and probe memory is to see if we can actually implant an entirely false memory. So this is a study that was done by uh, my colleague, Paul Franklin, to my husband. You saw him at the very beginning. Um, we were in grad school together and he's also a member of this important center. So um, a paper that came out from his lab recently found that he could implant a memory for an experience that never occurred in a mouse, just using what we know about engrams, um, taking advantage of optogenetic tools. And this was, I think, a really sort of the ultimate goal of what we you know, can do with um, playing around with artificial tools and memory. So um, again, back to um, uh, Paul Franklin and, and Stefan Carler, again, my, my friends from graduate school, we wrote a paper back in 2015 saying that I think that we're doing pretty well in finding the engram. And I think now we're poised, uh, along with the, um, the folks at the um, Max Planck University of Toronto Center for Neural Science and Technology, to actually take the next step and really try and understand how the brain encodes and stores information. So I'm going to um, finish up here uh, talking about how, with the aid of these new tools, we're really turning science fiction into science fact. So science fiction, eternal um, sunshine of the spotless mind, um, total recall, or inception, and these are three, you know, important sort of science fiction he takes on memory. And I'm going to um, uh, just point out that they all have a Toronto connection. So of course, Jim Carrey is famously from Toronto. Total Recall, the original one with Arnold, was filmed partly in Toronto. And Inception, no incredible Toronto connection, except that Elliot Page um, um, acts in this movie. And he, of course, is um, from the um, east coast of Canada, but lived for a few years in Toronto. So with that, I just wanna thank my um, uh, major collaborator, um, Paul Franklin, here he is with our daughter way back when we were able to travel and especially the amazing folks in my lab. Here we are on our annual selfie day. This is from um, two years ago. And this is us looking not quite as happy in our pandemic selfie day. So I'm just going to stop there and I welcome any questions and it would be, um, and I'm really looking forward to um, seeing what the center is gonna develop into and I'm super excited about what the future holds. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jocelyn, uh, great talk. Uh, we have a question. Um, the question is, if we're able to artificially excite neurons to help retrieve memories, do you think this could later be applicable to amnesic individuals or those with memory disorders? Super question. And that's, that's absolutely the goal. So we can um, do this also in mice that model Alzheimer's disease. So there's different forms of Alzheimer's disease. There's one form that we know the genetic basis. And we can take the gene that causes Alzheimer's in some people and we put it in mice and we get forgetful mice. And what we can do, which is sort of, again, like science fiction, is with very early onset, so we don't wait very long for the memory to um, be made, we can actually get the mouse to artificially retrieve the memory when this mouse that mimics Alzheimer's wouldn't. Now, this is a long way from you know, Alzheimer's disease in, in a person, but it is the first step to show this is sort of proof of principle that this might happen before there's any sort of neurodegeneration. But that's a really, that's exactly our goal here. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have another question in the Q&A. What technology is used to implant the artificial memories? And, and they've also said that it was a great presentation. Ah, thank you. So implanting the memories is super cool. So what we, what um, this is, this is my um, colleague Paul Franklin did is he chose um, um, a, a, he chose um, a smell memory because in the brain we understand exactly where different smells are encoded in different glomeruli. And um, by taking advantage of that, he could optogenetically activate different smell neurons, basically, and have the mouse recall, and he would pair that with um, an artificially aversive stimulus in the brain. So nothing actually happened, the mouse just sat around, and they artificially um, um, activated the smell neuron, and then they artificially activated a neuron that seemed to cause the mouse some, some discomfort. And they paired those two, just like we would in real life, 
but without any of the stimuli. And then later he could test these mice with the smell, the smell that the mouse has never actually smelled before in their real life, but they've had that certain neuron um, activated and the mouse would, would stay away from that smell as if it had physically been paired with a foot shock. So it's, it's, I'm telling you, it is very much like science fiction. And we could do it with smell because we understand the smell circuit. And at some point we'll be able to understand all the other sort of sensory input circuits. So we can really, really get to a deeper understanding of how you know, you know, memories are encoded in the brain. Wonderful. Um, this question, I, I suppose, kind of uh, backs onto the one you just answered, but is there anything that makes particular cells susceptible to becoming engram cells or is it totally non-selective? Yes. Right, so we're, we're examining that right now. I mean, we can do all our sort of um, optogenetic tricks and all these artificial ways of doing things. And it sort of becomes, well, is that really how the brain works? There's many different ways you can hotwire a car to make it start, but that doesn't mean that's how cars normally start. So that's what we're really doing now is saying, you know, how is the brain normally doing this? What really is important? And we, we have some really cool data coming out just by endogenously watching these cells fire before um, while the mouse is um, remembering something and learning something is to say that excitability is really key, but that's not the only factor. So we're just getting to this sort of tip of the iceberg on this. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you very much for your talk once again. And I'd like to extend a sincere thank you to all of our wonderful speakers for today. Um, and at this time, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Joyce Poon and Dr. Topik Valiante for closing remarks. Thank you. And, and, a, and a thank you also to uh, Jean Ping Feng as well, co chair. Thank you. So, th those were indeed a set of wonderful talks and science fiction, all, all of them uh, in, their own, in their own right. I think uh, we're super excited to be part of that science fiction, hopefully, catalyze it through establishment of this uh, the center. So I'd like to thank all the speakers for these uh, amazing uh, uh, talks. Over to you, Joyce. Thank you to all of you for tuning in today and to celebrate with us the launch of this Max Planck University of Toronto Center for Neuroscience and Technology. Let us all do great things together. Um, with that, I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon and a pleasant evening. Goodbye for now. Auf Wiedersehen.